Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we are looking at the Haven of Umbar. The blade that was broken shall return to Minas Tirith. So before I get into the video, I wanted to give a massive thank you if you've come over to the new channel to help us start again here on The Broken Sword. To make sure we could give you an upload as quickly as possible, we are starting with a re-upload. And this is the one of our last lore video on the old channel, and that is a look at the Haven of Umbar. Now I would like to emphasize again that we will not just be re-uploading old content, we will be putting new stuff out. But we thought this was a logical place to start so that you have something here to watch. So I hope you enjoy the video, and now let's get into it. In the days of the Numenorean kings, this ennobled Westron speech spread far and wide, even among their enemies, and it became used more and more by the Dunajai themselves, so that at the time of the War of the Ring, the Alvan tongue was known to only a small part of the peoples of Gondor, and spoken daily by fewer. These dwelt mostly in Minas Tirith and the townlands adjacent, and in the lands of tributary princes of Dalamma. Yet the names of nearly all places and persons in the realm of Gondor were of alvish form and meaning. A few of forgotten origin, and descended doubtless from the days before the ships of the Numenorean sailed the sea. Among these were Umbar. Umbar, one of the great havens of Middle-earth. Umbar was located to the south of Gondor, below the Anduin at the Bay of Belfalas which was a great gulf of the Great Sea lying to the south of Gondor, and during the drowning of Numenor, the Bay of Belfalas was filled, and the land upheaved around it. The area that contained Umbar has almost nothing known about it before the days of the Numenorean migration. All that is known is that towards the end of the First Age, the branches of the First Men must have spread as far south as Umbar, and the First Men refers to the event of the Awakening of Men, or in other words, the stirring of the first men in Middle-earth that happened in the far eastern lands of Hildorian, at the beginning of the First Age. They wake up when the first sun rose up in the west. However, apart from knowing that that is where they originally came from, it is not until the year 2280 of the Second Age that a proper recorded history is really started, and this is with the Numenorians turning Umbar into a great fortress of Numenor. This new fortress of Umbar was turned into the strongest and most important as a base to fight against the threat of Sauron growing in Mordor, and it would end up being the settlement mainly being the home for the King's Men. These King's Men were a section of the Numenorians that make up the majority of the people living on Numenor in the later half of the Second Age, and they followed the policies to build the pride and wealth of the Isle. The King's Men received this name because they had the support of most of the Numenorean kings after Tar Atanami, who led the people to a policy of rebellion against the Valar. The King's Men became hostile to the Aldar and the Valar because they envied their immortality and despised the ban of the Valar. To compensate for the restriction that the ban placed on them, they voyaged east from Numenor to Middle-earth, where they set up great dominions and colonies in the south amongst the Haradrim which is where Umbar comes into things. In this way they amassed much wealth which they then took back to Numenor, and during the time that the shadow fell on Numenor, Umbar was the northernmost settlement of the king's men in Middle-earth, and Sauron, after trying to disrupt the powers of the Numenorians, attempted to attack their havens and forts and invaded their coastlands in Middle-earth, but Umbar resisted. It came to the year 3261 when Arfaraz on the Golden landed in Umbar to challenge Sauron. So after arriving here, he and his armies journeyed for seven days to take the battle to Sauron himself in Mordor, and this is where Sauron would then surrender to them and their amazing strength, and then be taken as a prisoner back to Numenor. Umbar remained as a symbol of Numenorean pride ever after. Umbar itself remained rarely mentioned for a time while Sauron himself was in Numenor, but it must have been important as a point of deportation of slaves and taxes being sent back to Numenor. Once the downfall of Numenor happened, there was a large amount of Numenorians who remained here, but here it was not like those who founded Gondor and Arnor, instead it was the group known as the Black Numenorians. This group were not friendly to the likes of the elves or their fellow faithful Numenorian survivors, Instead, they were cruel oppressors and overlords over the primitive men of Middle-earth. 
Although never really confirmed, it can be strongly believed that the men from Umbar were sent to fight for Sauron during the war against the last alliance of elves and men, and therefore shared in the loss and downfall of the Dark Lord at this time. This is where Umbar would move into the Third Age of Middle-earth. Leaders from here had high levels of influence over the peoples of Harad as the years went by, and Umbar gradually over time took on more and more native cultures belonging to those people of Harad. Despite this, nothing of note would really take place in Umbar for the next few hundred years, and his people lived somewhat of a peaceful time within themselves during this. However, outside of Umbar during these same years, their neighbours in Gondol would be growing more and more powerful, and eventually surpass the strength that Umbar itself had, leading to Gondol gradually spreading its hold further south along the coast. So this meant it was inevitable, Gondol would one day attack. And in the year 933 of the Third Age, this finally happened. Here, the then King of Gondor, King Aenil I led a surprise attack on Umbar, sieging the fortress by both land and sea. Although he managed to take Umbar, it came at great cost to his own men, but still, Umbar now became a great harbour and fortress in the name of Gondor. And also as another little interesting point to add here, this King Aenil would actually die due to a great storm that devoured a great number of his ships and men just outside of Umbar in the year 936. But now, Umbar would have some peace for the next 82 years, but in the year 1015 the previous inhabitants launched an attempt to recapture it, and despite killing the then king, Kiriandil, during that siege, as well as besieging the fortress of Umbar for 35 years, they ultimately failed to take it, with a big factor being that its supply was easily maintained due to the sea power of Gondor reinforcing it. So in the 35th year, being 1050 of the Third Age, the late King Kiriandil's son, Kiriahur, finally defeated the Haradrim force. All land south of Balfalas up to Harnan and the borders of near Harad and coastlands up to Umbar belong to Gondor now. Also during these years under Gondor there was a monument built to Arpharazon, and this was placed on the highest hill above the Haven. A great white pillar crowned with a globe of crystal which shone as a star with the rays of the sun or moon. Umbar was considered an important Gondorian city during this time, not only as a major seaport, but also as the site of the submission of Sauron to Arpharazon, and so served as a proud reminder of the might of the Dúnedain of old. Now again, there was a period of more peaceful times until the year 1437, when a rebellion arose due to the civil war of Gondor which in total lasted from 1437 to 1447 of the Third Age. Together with the people of the city of Pelagia, Umbar supported a usurper named Castamir. This rebellion would last for ten years, and end with the death of Castamir. When the war had ended, Castamir's sons and their supporters left Pelagia and established themselves at Umbar, and then from that point on, Umbar remained an enemy of the king. And also here, if you would like a video on the full story of this Gondor Civil War, then please get this video to hit 2000 likes along with leaving a comment of Civil War in the comment section below. But anyway, it was after this time that the descendants of Castamir grew in power and took up the name of the Corsairs of Umbar. They considered themselves as an independent settlement completely opposed to Gondor, which also meant that over the next couple of hundred years they were constantly at war with the Gondorians, and this really took its toll on Gondor, for Umbar would constantly send attacks on their ships and raid their coastal towns whenever the opportunity would arise. This severely weakened both Gondor's strength in the south as well as its naval power in general. In fact, in the year 1540 the king of Gondor, Aldemir, who took the crown after Castamir's rebellion was slain in a battle against the men of Harad and the Corsairs of Umbar. Umbar would not rest for long, as in the year 1634, the now great grandsons of Castamir, Angamite and Sangiando, raided the city of Pelagia from Umbar, even killing the then king, Minardil, as well. Gondor's reaction was slow due to the great plague that hit Middle Earth, however, that did not mean that they had by any means forgotten what had happened as, 78 years later, when the Corsairs were raiding as far away as Anfalas, the great grand nephew of Minardril, the 26th king of Gondor, Telumitar, saw his moment to strike. 
he launched his attack on Umbar, destroying the fortress that stood there, driving out those who lived there and killing those who were descended from Castamere, finally retaking Umbar in the name of Gondor. However, this area was not left protected afterwards, and was just left as an unsettled and ruined area after this point. In the centuries that followed this, Umbar was neglected and was only ever an afterthought to those in Gondor, which meant that the men of Harad could come and reclaim it and start rebuilding there. They started a new generation of Corsairs of Umbar, and these new Corsairs were known to be cruel slavers who would raid the coast of Balfalas and Anfalas in Gondor. They even managed to kill the 15th Prince of Dolamoth, Amrathos, in 2746 when he fell defending Doran Urnil against these men. Not long after, in 2758, Umbar joined a massive coordinated attack with the men of Harad and even men of Dunland against Gondor and the newly formed realm of Rohan. Then again in 2885, Umbar supported the Haradrim who claimed southern Gondor, although this land had been long debated land between those of the Corsairs and the Kings. And then again when Sauron declared himself openly in 2951, Umbar declared its allegiance to him, and it's at this time that the great monument of Arpharazon's triumph was destroyed. So then, 29 years after they declared their allegiance to Sauron, Umbar's fleet was attacked and largely destroyed in a devastating move against them. This was when a man who went by the name of Thorongil, who we later find out to be a young Aragorn, who was in service of the steward of Gondor Ecthelion II, led a task force south and burned them all, also killing the captain of the Haven in the process and gaining great renown amongst the men of Gondor albeit he did not return here until much, much later. Umbar would never truly be able to recover from this though, even by the time of the War of the Ring. Despite them not holding the strength that they once did, they were still able to send as many as 50 great ships, along with a number of smaller vessels too, to raid and pillage the coastlands of Gondor as a distraction from the defence of Minas Tirith. But Aragorn would turn his eye to them once again, and with the handy appearance of the dead men of Dunharrow, they were once again able to completely wipe out the Corsairs of Umbar. So then, once Sauron had fallen for good, and Umbar no longer possessed the strength to really rebel, it finally submitted to the crown of Gondor, pledging its allegiance to the now King Elisar. So although we know nothing of Umbar after this time, it must just be assumed that it became another great city of Gondor in the new peaceful age of men in Middle Earth. So there we have it, a look at the history of the Great Haven of Umbar in the south. Some people may be surprised at just how much has gone on here, considering it's a place that's not really talked about that much. I do expect there are many people who may know about one or two of these events but not even realise that they happened in Umbar itself. This is really an area that has some great history behind it, even if you didn't realise it. So also I would like to give you a quick reminder here that if you do want that video on the full story of the Gondor Civil War, then please get this video to 2000 likes along with leaving a comment of Civil War in the comment section below so that I can know that there is interest in this topic. But anyway, now we've done that, I have my question for you today, and that is, how much of a difference do you think it would have made later during the War of the Ring if Aragorn, when disguised as Thorongil, never managed to destroy the Umbar fleet in 2980 of the Third Age? Please let me know your thoughts and opinions on how things could have been different in the comment section below. And now we have reached the end of our first lore video here on the Broken Sword. I hope you enjoyed it and that you are looking forward to the future of this channel. But I would also like to remind you all we do not just have this channel but also two others and they are the 6th range of Power Rangers content and History of Dragon Ball for Dragon Ball content. Links for both of those will be in the description below if you would like to watch and support us on those as well. And now we will continue to finish off as we always have done, and that is with a shout out to all of our patrons. For those of you who have stuck around during this uncertain time for us, we just cannot thank you all enough. And again, I want to just reassure you all that every single Patreon donation is still going towards our short film project. But now it is time to shout out our highest tier members. Firstly, our Divine Power tier members of Kevin, Michael, Abram, Matt and Glorfindel of Gondolin. You are all awesome. And also a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nasheeth, Lorenzo, Denver Steel and Gregory. And as well, I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier member of Andrew to go along with them. You are all true legends of the Brohirim. And finally, if you have not already as well, 
please do all that great stuff. Hit the like button on the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon for notifications to help us reclimb up those YouTube rankings. So thank you once more if you have managed to reach the very end of this video with me, and we will see you next time on The Broken Sword.